With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Herd Tell. Hi, welcome back to Hertel. Okay, let's go back over to the UK. Everybody's had their little break from our UK news for the last uh, few weeks we've been going through. There's a lot going on over there. This is who's going to walk us all through it, explain it so well that even I will be able to understand it. He's a Young Voices contributor, real sharp guy. Looking forward to this. Uh, Benjamin Coates, how are you, sir? Thank you so much for the time. Hello, Andrew. No, no, no worries. I'm, I'm well. Thank you. Uh, live from London uh, on this fine day. Uh, let's let's start here, big picture, because, of course, all the eyes of the world were on England and the UK for the last uh, two, three weeks now with the passing of the Queen. Politically, though, that became kind of the eye of the storm because things politically uh, were going kind of really ugly. Everybody kind of got the pause because of the Queen's death. You have this great moment of national unity. Boy, howdy, has the storm come back and in a hurry, hadn't it? Yeah. Well, I think the uh, was it the is it a Chinese proverb about interesting times, uh, and they are they're interesting times here. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we're going to talk some foreign policy with you because you've been writing about it. But let's start domestically because everybody's worried about that, the cost of living crisis. Uh, people are talking about taxes. People are talking about economic programs. People are talking about uh, getting direct assistance to people for this looming winter. Let's just start that. Uh, you got a brand new prime minister who, <laughs> how's that for your first day on the second day on the job and the queen died yes. and handed that one. Uh, so really, this has kind of been her first week at work for all intents and purposes. How's it going? Is it as rough on the ground as it's looking on the media and from afar? Uh, well, I mean, I suppose it is. Just only, I think, an hour ago, I think a, a poll came out with something like a 20 or 30 point Labour lead, which is. Uh, only seen that in the mid 90s just before Blair came in but there are big caveats to that uh we're not going to have an election tomorrow uh and there does seem to have been uh, an overreaction uh to the sort of so-called mini budget and all the rest I don't want any of your listeners to to switch off so I won't uh talk too much about it but there are so many problems uh, in the world uh, economically for a lot of countries, the very strong dollar, obviously all that's going on in Ukraine. And I think perhaps the pound and Britain has been singled out a little, uh, and they've definitely been market jitters. But I think nothing is happening here that is unprecedented. We're lowering our top rate of tax to the rate it was during a Labour government. Uh, it's still more than many countries, including the US. And Every nation, really, in our position, uh, and Germany's just announced this, will be given uh, money for energy prices this uh, winter. Nothing that strange was announced, and I think it is a bit of a storm in a teacup. That's not to say that there aren't recessions coming and difficult economic times, but that's not entirely down to the budget. Far from it, and you see that you'll see that Europe, Europe wide, at least. Yeah. One of our founding principles on our program is things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a sequence for the casual observer, though, because everybody focuses on the moment. They're like, well, you know, the conservatives have been in power for 12 years. So it's all that it's more than that, because we understand economics is an up and down thing over decades, not over even years or quarters. There's repercussions. You've had a lot of economic things happen in the UK. You have demographic change. You have immigrant change. You have Brexit Going back the last 10 or 15 years, especially because everybody's talking about that 12 years of, of conservative rule, as they should, because, you know, cyclically, it's going to catch up to you at some point. But economics don't go along with the politics. Go to the last 10 or 15 years that brought Britain to this moment. Yes, there's a crisis. But what the crisis is really doing is revealing the cracks and the issues that were already there. Right. That's absolutely right. And I think that with uh, in democracies, at least you you reap what the guy before you sowed. And we are now seeing the culmination in many regards of the mismanagement of our country for decades under both Blair uh, in New Labour and also the Conservatives since 2010, uh, where we haven't had a jot of economic growth since 2008. 
We didn't invest when it was cheap to borrow. Uh, we didn't build the nuclear power stations that we've needed to build. And we have a historic shortage, which is completely voluntary, by the way. It's based on legislation and it wouldn't cost a penny to repeal. Uh, with regards to planning permission to build houses and, and also you know, businesses and scientific labs. So Liz Truss really has got into the, the chair at the wrong point. And I'm not saying that the, the, the budget was, was perfect or the messaging around it is perfect, but we are now a relatively poor country, which is a bitter uh, pill to swallow. And it's one I think a lot of my countrymen refuse to. But the situation we're in really has been, as you say, a culmination of 10 or 20 years of actions. She came to the job a couple of days ago. No one, however bad, could screw up an economy in two or three days that didn't have very serious problems uh, made by people previous. Yeah, Ben Coach joining us from London. Uh, it's always going to be a little bo bit of both. The policies you actually enact and the policies you don't enact, both of those have almost, you know, an effect. Give me the ratio because you have a parliamentary system. So especially in America, you know, we look as like, look, what with very few legal exceptions and a little bit of judicial oversight, pretty much what parliament says goes. So even more so than in the states, when it's a policy, either omission or commission, sin of policy, whether you did it or you didn't do a policy or the policy was bad, this is almost entirely on parliament. Yes. Yes. In uh, fundamentally, yes. The uh, trouble, one of the troubles with our country is that, uh, I suppose, business life uh, and you know, economic life more generally actually goes through loads of layers, you know, local government, planning permission, things like that, where Parliament should have legislated and Parliament has the power, Parliament has supreme power. The, the saying goes that Parliament could ban smoking on the streets of Paris, which is, as it were, an analogy to say that it, Parliament is supreme in our constitution. It can command anything. But politicians, our politicians in Westminster, haven't commanded the things that would improve economic growth. So the trouble is that actually you've had local politics strangle housing, strangle scientific lab spacing and so on, uh, was really one of the big contributors to our economic crisis. If you're thinking about trying to locate cost of living problems in the UK, which obviously is a big theme, try the fact that the percentage of your income to either rent or mortgage is vastly higher than really any time in our country's history. Uh, so, yes, it is a problem in Parliament. It's caused often by actions lower down. But yes, it, it is on Parliament that we're here. Uh, let's talk prime ministers. You got the brand new one in Liz Truss. You had Boris Johnson, of course, Theresa May before her, and then we can go on back as far as you want to go. I think she's purposefully, and it's part of her character. Boris, good, bad, or indifferent, was a bit of a circus at all times. Even when he was, <laughs> even when you're doing something he liked, yeah. it was still a circus. I think she purposefully set a sober, sober turn um, in her demeanor. Her first prime minister questions was very by the book. Better matter of fact. It seems to me that she gets the moment. Does she really have a whole lot of options here? Because like you said, you know, it's it's probably an overreaction right now. And you're talking, you know, let's be honest, the stuff they're doing with this budget, this is wonky terms. This is tax rates. This is, you know, marginal incomes. This isn't really good messaging stuff. And everybody's aware that winter's coming and this winter is going to be hard no matter what you do. You already touched on it. Practically, there's probably not a lot of levers she has to pull here. What should this government be doing messaging wise to try to maybe get something out to the people? Because just talking about tax rates ain't going to hack it. No, in the optics of doing a tax cut, whatever the merits of the policy was appalling. Announcing a cut to the top rate of tax at this moment uh, was an appalling, um, appallingly bad maneuver in terms of appearances to people on the street. But it's really, really insignificant. The cut to the basic 
tax rate costs far more and Labour say they're going to keep it. The energy cap costs a lot more and we're going to keep that. Everyone wants to keep some sort of subsidy for energy, otherwise people will simply freeze to death given events. What needs to be the messaging uh, really is that economic growth, which is what they've set out to do, is the only way out medium to long term of the decline that this country has seen arguably since the end of the Second World War. It has been a century almost of decline and what we need is economic growth. The top rate of tax cut was a bad decision in terms of optics. It doesn't actually change much economically. The message needs to be that we need growth and also that people are going to be supported because in the whole fuss we've had, people are completely forgetting the quite generous uh, energy subsidies. And there've been all sorts of graphs on Twitter and in the papers, which show that people on higher incomes benefit from an, uh, the income tax decreases. Yes, that's true. But if you add in the very substantial reduction to people's energy bills, that completely flips it around. Because naturally, let's say you're on, you're doing very well, you're doing extremely well, doing half a million a year. Naturally, on a graph, you are going to benefit a great deal from the cut in 45%, going down to 40% of the top uh, rate tax. But you're probably not going to notice the energy subsidy. Yet, let's say you're on £25,000 a year. Okay, you're not going to get a great deal of benefit at all from the uh, cut in tax, but you will see a vast, vast uh, help from this energy subsidy. So there needs to be the messaging that we need growth, and there needs to be the messaging that actually there is help. Ignore what's on you know, the news, ignore what the stock market does over the course of two or three days. You know, markets panic, people get on bandwagons. There's help and we need growth. That's what I'd do. Folks, if you've listened to the Herd Tell program, you've heard our friend Gabriella Hoffman, but you need to make sure you're checking out her podcast, District of Conservation. It's a podcast exploring the nuances of true conservation efforts from D.C. and beyond. From topic discussions to exclusive interviews with conservation and energy newsmakers, Gabriella keeps listeners appraised of the latest news stories while elevating important voices. Listen to the District of Conservation on Apple Podcasts or wherever podcasts are played. Ben Coach joining us. Longer term economic and much harder to deal with, though, is the things people do notice. They notice their food prices when they go to buy food and groceries and such like thing. They notice their housing cost prices, whether that be renting or mortgage or whatever the case may be. Those are things that are lagging indicators. Those aren't things you're going to be able to just, you know, helicopter money, we call yes. it economically. You're not going to helicopter money food costs. That's a longer term thing. That gets into some of the trade issues that, uh, the UK is having that get us into some of the kind of baked into the economic, the state that the UK finds it. I know they're talking about it. Is there any actual plans in the works to do anything about it? Cause it's probably too late for the winter, but going into the spring, going into next year, part of leadership is having not just an immediate plan because the voters are upset, but a long-term plan. Does anybody seem to have one? Well, when you talk about rent, food prices, I think the honest thing, Although I think if you're a senior politician, you probably shouldn't say this, given how easily the markets do speak. The fact is that there is going to be a recession. It will probably last a year or two. It will not be isolated to the United Kingdom and has precious little to do, actually, with Liz Truss's two week long premiership. However bad a politician you were, you could not possibly have caused all that is coming to us it would not be a popular line to deliver. And it's one I don't think politicians should deliver purely because, again, markets spook. But the fact is that due to the war in Ukraine, uh, due to a historic stupidity amongst European leaders, and by that I include the British, uh, in terms of not taking up stuff like nuclear energy, and the very strong dollar that's causing problems, causing problems in Asia as well, 
it's going to be really tough for a year or two. There are things that the government can do, but you cannot uh, avoid a what is going to be a global recession, probably, definitely a continental recession for a year or two. Sometimes I think you just have to put your hands up and, and realize that it's going to be tough. Would it be good messaging, Ben Coach, joining us for Liz Trust? You, you can't say it the way you just said it, because like you said, you know, politics is marketing and branding. You can't say it like that. But wouldn't it just be good politics? Because there's no way this is going to have a good ending in the near term for her to just come out and say, look, this is going to be hard because we've seen this with our own president on certain things. If, if you don't take some of the blame, if it gets better later, you're going to have a hard time getting any of the credit. Should she get out in front of this a little bit? How much honesty is needed for the moment? How much honesty is too much honesty with the um, I, I hate to use the term because it gets into economic stuff. But, you know, there, there's going to be some bad times coming soon. There's going to be some, you know, there's going to be some attrition here. Just bluntly. How much should she get take some blame now and just get in front of it? And how much truth is too much truth, do you think? Well, I suppose uh, that the truth would almost be that her taking any blame would be a little wrong. As I've said, I think the real problems are structural. I think the real problems are historical. Does she, should she be honest and say tough times are coming? Yes. But you also have to have a certain amount of optimism. There are very, very significant gains that a government can uh, can, can make in terms of our economy by deregulating. So we've got some very poor regulations that actually don't cost a penny. You know, they, they, they cost the salaries of whoever is rewriting the, the legislation. We can do that and it will have a certain effect and it will have an increasing effect as the years go on. Really, if you're looking at her political situation, I think the, the trouble is she's got into the chair at the wrong point. We are two years away from an election. Do I think ultimately that some of the pro-growth uh, messaging, but also... Uh, measures that are hinted at in the mini budget do i think they're ultimately the right path yes do they really need to be enacted over let's say a five ten even 15 year time span to really have the effect yes she's only got two years uh, it's a very very sticky wicket to use a, a cricket analogy which may not be uh, best for american radio but there we go i think that yes yeah, she needs to say times are tough Yes, she needs to emphasise that the growth is what matters and that we, there is growth. You know, the British economy could be substantially bigger than it is now and it would require very little government intervention. It actually requires the government to, to stand back and let uh, businesses get on with things. But in the ultimate analysis, it maybe doesn't matter what she says. She's only got two years. She's basically sat down on the chair. The Queen has died and now there's a recession. Be careful what you wish for. Perhaps uh, it maybe it's uh, <laughs> maybe it's a very important tale for all of us. She's got the dream job, and I think it's probably too late. Yeah. Now you said Ben Coach joining us. You're saying two years. Most of the people we've talked to in the UK, most of our contributors are there. They're like, in reality, she's got about two months to really make this thing work, to make her name on it, to kind of get a handle on this. Um, she's got a very small window. She's got a very cantankerous uh, parliament to deal with. La Labor seeing their best numbers in decades, so they're licking their chops. She's probably not super sure about some of the folks sitting behind her on the benches because she's new to the job. Has, is this one of the tougher non-wartime premiership starts that we've seen? And put it in a little bit of context, just how steep a hill we're talking here. Well, I, I think wars are a lot easier, uh, bluntly, um, because uh, the very worst. I was an enlisted maybe, guy, not on my end, but I, I take your point. <laughs> yes, for for politicians, wars are a lot easier. Maybe I'll I'll rephrase that. It's extremely tough, and I think that if she did pull off even a very slim majority at the next election, it would be a, a you know a real comeback story, possibly even worthy of a you know a feature length film. It is very tough, and there's really no sugarcoating that can, uh, you know, that can improve that. But I think it would be tough for anyone in that position. And whether that she may survive, let's say they lose the next election, would she survive to fight another election? Probably not. But I think you've got to uh, have a certain amount of admiration for her for trying.
Ben Coach joining us from London, UK contributor with Young Voices, sharp guy. Let's talk foreign policy, something that's kind of up your alley. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, the world keeps turning. That's just the way things are. Yes. Uh, the UK has some pretty serious foreign policy issues going on. Um, domestically, they've got plenty of issues like we just detailed, but even inside the domestic, you know, Northern Ireland's a problem. They've got the channel migrate problem. Um, wider than that, though, they've been they've been getting credit for their support of Ukraine. You've done some writing, though. The Royal Navy, which, you know, for a long time, the standard of the world and Britain's pride in a lot of ways, their national pride, not in great shape right at the moment. I know that seems like maybe a smaller priority to, you know, food prices and stuff, but you can't be a world power without a world power military. And there's some cracks that are very apparent. And you've been writing about it when it comes to the Royal Navy. Well, there are. And I think problems with your military, if you are indeed a, a sort of a global player. Uh, don't matter until they do, and when they do, they matter a great deal. And you've seen this with Russia. Russia, on paper, had a very strong military. Some said it was the second strongest military in the world after the United States. We've seen really what happens if you maybe have the numbers on paper, maybe even have the tanks uh, or the artillery pieces or whatever. But if you don't have the right source, and if you're not properly trained and so on, that means very little. Now, when you look at the Royal Navy, the training is excellent. A lot of the ships, they're modern. Uh, a lot of the radars or the rest and the fighter aircraft that uh, we we share with you, we, we, we buy the F-35 like you do, are excellent. So you might be wondering, well, what's the matter? The trouble is that we don't have enough uh, aircraft. We can fly off carriers and we don't have the missiles to fire off them and we don't have the missiles that we need to fire off our ships there was a recent uh, house of commons uh, sort of session where they described our navy as a porcupine navy which is to say that it's more than capable of defending itself but it has extremely little ability to actually reach out and attack and that's the big problem and that we'd see that was a problem if we go to war uh, over taiwan uh, ben Coach joining us. Um, we saw what happened in Afghanistan. Uh, the American pullout made a mess. Uh, our British friends stood with us through the mess. They carried a lot of that burden, frankly, uh, honorably and very heroically, by the way. We've been allies for a long, long time. The special relationship, you know, I look, my military service, we did lots of cross stuff with the Brits. We all, I always enjoyed working with them for a lot of reasons. Uh, not to mention that the uh, the Queen still let them drink deployed and we weren't allowed, but we'll talk about that. Oh, yes. time. Uh, but w w it's it's an amazing relationship and one that both parties really enjoy getting to work together and serve together. We trust each other. I don't know that that trust extends to the bureaucracies that manage our militaries. Um, in the U.S., of course, there's the massive military industrial complex. There's a lot of bureaucracy that's involved. For an audience that's not familiar with it, what is the state of the political and the bureaucratic part of the UK's armed for forces, Whitehall? What, what is its standard? Is the bureaucracy the problem? Is it the politics of it? Is it the higher leadership? Because the frontline troops are excellent. I will attest to that personally. We saw them in Afghanistan. The bravery still there. So the problem's got to be coming from the top, yeah? Oh, yes, absolutely. And uh, thank you for your kind words. And I know uh, for a fact that uh, British troops always think highly of the American ones with whom they train alongside whom they fight. I don't think the problem really is necessarily anywhere within our military. The problem, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but history, both recent and and more generally, hasn't been so kind to us. Since the uh, end of the Cold War, and particularly after the financial crisis in 2008, the British Armed Forces received exceptionally little funding. Further, they were expected to operate in Afghanistan and Iraq out of their budget, which diminished it further. And yet another problem was that naturally, when you're having all those counterinsurgency operations, the very, very, there's a very, very tempting thing to cut, which is the Navy because you can't sail many ships in Afghanistan or Iraq. You instead want to be buying things like uh, 
you know, Humvees, which can resist uh, mines and, and that sort of stuff. So the trouble is that this shortage of missiles and aircraft comes not only from low spending, but the fact that for 10, 15 years, we were fighting uh, with you guys in the global war on terror. So funding priority has been everywhere other than what you could call great power competition and the sort of naval forces you'd need for that. Ben Coates continuing to join us from the UK. When, when you look at a military, though, having a military is extremely expensive. You have two concurrent events running parallel right now that I think will conflict with the, with the UK people because you have a cost of living crisis. So it's like, well, why are we spending money on a military in a cost of living crisis? But at the same time, they all watch what happened in Ukraine. It's like, okay, this is why you spend on a military because at any given moment, some madman does something crazy and you really, really need to have a strong military those narratives are going to war with each other. They always have in the history of mankind. That's just how it is in the modern world. How does that play out in the UK though? Because they're happening at the same time. Everybody's seeing both, but one of them's hitting your dinner table and the other one's hitting your conscious. Walk us through how that's landing with the, the folks in the UK. Well, that's a very good point. Of course, uh, you know, belts are tightening and we also need to spend some more money on defense. I suppose your second point that obviously Ukraine's been going on I think very few people in our country right now would question the need for sensible defence spend, uh, spending. Obviously, it can't be a blowout, but the problems we have, particularly with regards to the Royal Navy, are not that expensive to fix. They're not cheap, nothing in defence is, but they're not that expensive. And I think with the world as it is now, with the invasion of Ukraine, with rising tensions over Taiwan, I don't think it'd be politically too hard to sell to increase defence spending by 10 or 20 percent, which ultimately would not leave us with an outrageous, you know, egregious outlier in, in terms of our defence spending. It would actually be very easy to get that money and more if we cut uh, our foreign aid budget. The foreign aid budget is probably the juiciest, biggest slice of, uh, you know, government spending cake that there is, which very few people in our country would actually object to uh, rowing back on given circumstances. Whether there's a political will or nows to do that, I don't know. But the money that we need to correct the problems I've identified is there just about. Yeah. Ben Coach joining us. One more question on the foreign policy front. Uh, there was a lot. There's long been a sense that there would be trouble in the Commonwealth when the Queen died. That has happened now. There seemed to be a lot more steadiness than I think some people, maybe a lot of that was overblown. There are a few places, though, the Caribbean, other places that are starting to talk about it. Is that an issue in the UK? Are people thinking or talking about it? Is it a back burner? Is it just media noise? Talk to us about the current state of the Commonwealth and the future of it. The Commonwealth is, I think, for some people, an emotional attachment. But I think that attachment is largely limited to those who would be very interested in politics and maybe those in government. The man in the street, as it were, has extremely little uh, interest in the Commonwealth, uh, less interest still if uh, you know someone in the Caribbean doesn't want uh, you know King Charles as head of state. It really doesn't matter to us. I suppose it's as blunt as I can be. Monarchies continue, that's the nature of monarchies, and so King Charles has been widely accepted and there's been a lot of sympathy, even on the personal level, you may not be a monarchist, but on a personal level, obviously, the gentleman's lost his mother and has had to parade for days and days and days on end uh, before, without wishing to be crass, his mother's uh, you know, body was cold. And so on a human level, there's a great deal of sympathy for him. There's no threat to the monarchy in this country. It will continue for decades really you know probably centuries at least i think it's, it's probably something which is going to go on and on and on whether it continues in australia whether it continues in the caribbean really i think that's a matter for australian or caribbean politics it's not the talking point here commonwealth simply has extremely little relevance to british politics and british daily life yeah ben coach let's loop back to where we started something that has a lot to do with your daily life the current economic crisis at hand Look, politics is a minute by minute thing. You can go crazy chasing, especially if you're over here trying to pay attention to a foreign country's politics. Give us a couple big picture things to pay attention to over the next couple of weeks. 
um, whether it's a policy thing or just the general messaging, you know, the, the pounds weight, the lowest I've ever seen it in my lifetime. I can't believe how low it is. Give us a couple of things that we should pay attention to. So when it does break through our news feed, you go, oh, okay, that's one of those things I need to pay attention to that's going on over there. That's an indicator I need to watch. Well, I suppose one of those things would be how the market behaves after this shock. I think it's been a panic and I, I'm not an expert in economics by any means, but I think just today the pound went up to, I think, was it one $1.10? Uh, where it had been on a low, I think, uh, one and three cents. So already we're seeing a bit of a recovery. That would, what I would say, be an important thing. Does the panic that we've seen over the past you know, few days really carry on over the next few weeks or months? I suspect not. As I said, it's going to be a recession. It's going to be a recession. And the uh, Europe-wide, it's probably going to be a worldwide recession. There is not going to be a tremendous amount of economic good news for the next few years as awful as it is to say but i think one of the things you will see is definitely the markets coming to their senses a bit and realizing that nothing in that mini budget or, or anything else is some strange outlier it's really economics as usual in the in, in the grand scheme of things there's nothing that should cause any level of panic as to a, a second thing well i think our politics really is buried in the cost of living stuff now uh, i think the second thing more generally I don't think uh, we were directly involved, but a second thing more generally, I think, to watch the news is how this uh, Nord Stream pipeline stuff transpires. It seems to be the, you know, the, perhaps the world's highest stakes game of Cluedo or something. You know, it's a murder mystery. Who blew up the pipeline? It seems to be in no one's interest really to do this, um, other than perhaps the United States, but that would obviously be an extremely rash course of action uh, blowing up you know allied pipelines so to speak sort of their share between russia and, and the rest of europe i i just on a purely personal level fascinated uh, i'd be fascinated to know what was going on there because it really not you'd think it was not in the russian interest they can simply turn the pipeline off i don't know why they blow it up but yeah we'll see yeah when irrational things involve people that have already proven to be irrational, it's hard to deal with it. I have my theories. We'll keep them to ourselves for right now because we're talking UK politics with our friend Ben Coates. Love talking with you. Great information. Appreciate it. Kind of sounds like y'all just need to print a whole bunch more runs of those steady on shirts. Is that kind of how it feels right now? Yeah, I think that sort of attitude will get you a, a long way. Yeah, it's almost a cliche, but at times like this, also a lot of good wisdom in there. Ben Coates, enjoyed your insight appreciate the time we'll get you back until we see you on herd tell again though let folks know where they can follow you what you've got going on we're going to link to two different pieces he wrote uh one on the royal navy another one on uh the conservative party that's uh an interesting window from about a month ago where things have changed a little bit it'll be fun to come yes. back and see how well you did with that uh yeah i, I think any any articles predicting political events and polls and such are you know probably uh fool, <laughs> foolish yeah, tell me about it. I got one floating around out there about how Biden shouldn't be president, but here we are. Uh, part of the gig, my friend, part of the gig. Uh, let folks know how they can follow you and keep up with you until they hear from you again on Hurtel. Well, I'd, I'd stay glued to your radio station because I'm far too clever to have any uh, Twitter accounts or anything like that. Uh, so don't worry, you won't have to hear any of me, any any of me more, and you don't have to read any of the, uh, the rubbish I, I put out. He does have a Young Voices page. We'll link to the pieces. Make sure you read them in full. They're very, very good. He's uh, playing it down. Sharp guy. Enjoy talking to him. Got to get you on Twitter, man. It's more fun out there. You get all kinds oh, of I'm, I'm on. I'm on Twitter, but I'm too clever to put my name to it. I'm too clever to put, <laughs> yeah, I had a great one yesterday because I took a run at uh, Patriarch Kirill and uh, got the Russian bot farms after me about how I need to be eaten by the teeth of the dogs and that kind of fun stuff. I actually yeah. tweeted it back out, so... There's mess on there, my friend, but that's why we talk to good friends like you, people of good faith, and we hash things out. Uh, ben Coates, thank you so much for the time today, my friend. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on, Andrew. Yeah, do it again soon, sir. Thank you.